Elaine Hoffman is a grandmother from Indiana who lived a quiet life. One morning in October 2015, she was going through her email when she noticed an advertisement to make money quick. Hoffman was no stranger to finances. She graduated college with a degree in math and had a successful career as a financial planner before she had to retire early due to health issues. But Elaine continued to manage her own retirement portfolio while investing in stocks and bonds. She managed to save enough money to keep her and her husband comfortable for the rest of their lives. But still, the ad intrigued her. She clicked on it and watched a video. In the clip, two attractive young millionaires talked to each other on board their private jet. They said that they made their fortune with the click of a button. Hoffman knew that they were just actors, but she still found herself wanting that lifestyle. When a phone number appeared at the end of the video, Hoffman called it. A man named Brian picked up the phone and said he was an account manager at Glen Ridge Capital. He told Hoffman that the company's mission was to usher clients into the realm of binary options training. Hmm. Hoffman never heard of binary options, but Brian broke it down for her. If she just invested a few hundred dollars, she would be able to set up an investment account and place bets on the value of currencies and commodities, from crude oil to Nike stock, to see if they would increase or decrease by a certain point in time. If she was right, she could win a huge return. But if she was wrong, she'd lose her entire investment. Hoffman understood the risk and was wary to invest. But Brian assured her that he and his co-workers would watch the markets and help her make a wager. He guaranteed up to 40% returns in the first three months. Even though Hoffman didn't need the money, she didn't want to miss out on a great opportunity to increase her savings and leave more to her grandchildren. To start, she deposited $1,000 and with Brian's help, received a decent return. Then he told her that if she increased her deposit to $5,000, Glen Ridge would add another 50% to make it 7,500. She quickly sent the money over. Eight months later, she had invested $150,000. She continued to successfully place wagers and make profits. Some bets lasted weeks, others lasted minutes, but she never got upset when she lost. As an experienced finance employee, Hoffman knew that you had to take big risks to make big returns. By June 2016, nine months after first seeing the ad for Glenridge Capital, Hoffman made a $4,000 profit. But when she tried to access her winnings, Hoffman was told she needed to make 1,000 high-risk trades first. She was frustrated and decided to pull her money out of Glenridge. But the manager said he couldn't do that. For a month, she kept trying, but was unable to draw her money. After a year, she'd only been able to take back $10,000 of her initial investment. Hoffman started to worry that she would never see her money again. One day, the Glenridge website went down. Hoffman called the office concerned. The person on the other line assured her that it was just a temporary service loss because the company was moving offices. When the website failed to relaunch, Hoffman continued calling over and over again. Eventually, they just stopped answering. On Instagram, Josh Cartu presented himself as a race car driver and successful entrepreneur. With his Dolce & Gabbana sneakers, perfectly coiffed hair, and frequent travel photos, Josh's 750,000 followers were frequently impressed by his posts. Every few days, he posted a solo shot of him in a new location, places like Rome, Abu Dhabi, Miami, and the Maldives. He befriended A-listers like James Marsden, Robert De Niro, and Martin Scorsese. He spent his riches on a custom private jet with carbon fiber trim. He owned 12 Ferraris and often paid the $75,000 fee to race them. His followers assumed he was either an up-and-coming tech billionaire or the heir to a massive family fortune. But the truth was that he was the son of a middle-class family from Ontario. Josh grew up in St. Catharines in the 1980s and 90s as a quiet, awkward kid. His mother died when he was six, leaving him and his brothers to be raised by their dad. He dropped out of high school and began washing cars at his dad's car dealership. Josh's biggest goal in life was to get rich. In the early 2000s, Josh tried to make it in the art world as a film director, but success was taking long 
longer than planned, so he pivoted to tech. He moved to Cyprus, where he started working at a gambling software company called Playtech. He studied the company's operations and took his boss's connections to build his own competitor gaming platform. After modest success, Josh then started calling himself an industry tycoon. By 2008, a California tech company recruited 29-year-old Cartu to be CEO of Rome Partners, another online gambling platform. On paper, he earned $165,000 per year, but apparently stole much more than that. Players accused Josh of denying them from their winnings and stealing entire jackpot prizes all for himself. In 2013, two investors from Wyoming launched a civil and federal court case against him for stealing their dividends from Rome Partners and pocketing the money into his personal bank account. A judge dismissed the charges when no one was sure exactly where Josh lived. Josh, as a dual Israeli-Canadian citizen, learned that he could use his passport to escape consequences. He couldn't get in trouble if no one could find him. In the meantime, he was becoming accustomed to the life of luxury that his stealing was giving him. He bought a Rolls Royce and two Ferraris, worth a grand total of $1 million. He moved into a high-tech apartment in Budapest, Hungary, complete with humidity controls, a touch-activated light-up staircase, and TV screens that came down from the ceiling. He was living the dream and was looking for ways to maintain it. Then, Josh learned about a new kind of high-risk options trading that was growing in popularity in Israel, binary options. Binary options are basically code for gambling in the investment world. But of course, this is never told in this way with potential investors in binary options. Josh and his brothers, David and Jonathan, teamed up to make a pretty penny off of the general public with no idea what they were getting into. Basically, in binary options trading, the investor will place a bet that a certain stock will be worth a certain amount at a certain time. If correct, the investor wins money. If wrong, he loses it all. But the Cartoon Brothers rigged the system so their company always won. Even when traded legally, binary options are risky because they can bankrupt investors in an instant. When the US first started allowing binary option trading in 2008, there were already a lot of scammers ready to prey on new investors. The FBI estimated that these scammers stole $10 billion every year between 2010 and 2017. Many of the fraudsters were operating over overseas in Israel, much like Josh and his brothers. The Cartoons chose to operate their business, Sandbox Media, out of Moshe Aviv Tower, the tallest skyscraper in Tel Aviv. They operated three trading sites, including B Options, Glenridge Capital, and Rumelia. The company's employees promised potential investors quick returns of 60 to 85 percent, even though the majority ended up losing most of their money. Employees also lied about their qualifications, location, and identity. They claimed that their number one priority was to make money for their investors. In reality, they just wanted to rip off clients. So many Israelis entered the fraudulent binary options trade that the government outlawed the practice in October 2017. The Cartoons' brand always manipulated their investors' bets so they would always end up winning and pocketing the money. A CFTC complaint says the brothers stole at least $165 million from their unknowing customers. They hired 40 people to work in call centers in Canada and the U.S. under the umbrella company of Sandbox Media. They created ads containing flashy digital banners and even falsely stated that Trevor Noah made a fortune through binary options trading. Employees were encouraged to lie about their financial backgrounds and use pressure tactics on their cold calls to get people to invest. Caller IDs were hidden so that the numbers couldn't be tracked. The Cartoon Brothers all used stage names. Former employees described the call centers as boiler rooms, characterized by constant competition and toxic masculinity. Brokers were required to bring in $50,000 per month from investors and receive their salaries in cash. The Cartoons held sales contests and charted their callers' commissions on the boards to create a spirit of one-upmanship in the workplace. When one brother took some employees to Berlin, he gave them his corporate credit card and said to go nuts. The $25,000 bill was expensed as staff entertainment. The true nature of Sandbox Media was hidden from employees. A former office manager thought it was actually a marketing company. In reality, it was 20 different subsidiaries legally registered in more than seven cities and not linked to one another, making it hard to trace them back to Sandbox Media. Third parties were responsible for the funds to shield the Cartoon Brothers from any suspicion. The company was incredibly successful, showing a multi-year profit of more than $233 million, outgrowing their corporate office in the Tel Aviv high-rise and moving to the ground floor of another building. The Cartoons started outsourcing their payment processing to third parties, which made profits increase even more. The success of the company attracted the attention of business magazines such as Forbes and the Financial Times, who Josh had interviews where he claimed he made his initial fortune through online gaming software and built on that by real estate and crypto investments. The Cartooses started drawing attention to themselves through their sports cars, racetracks, model girlfriends, and B 
beachfront villas. For David Cartoon's 35th birthday, he threw a gangster-themed party at a nightclub where they dressed for the theme, drank expensive liquor, and took a video of the night, which they later posted on YouTube. Almost one year after Hoffman tried to withdraw her money, she was starting to lose hope. After several failed attempts to find the location of Glenridge Capital, she found out it might actually be based in Israel. She contacted a lawyer there, but nothing came of it. She realized she had been CC'd on an email with other Glenridge investors and decided to reach out to them. Elaine realized she was just one of thousands of victims all over the world. Some of them were out hundreds of thousands of dollars. A few of the other investors had already done some of their own research. No matter which card two brand they invested in, their credit cards had all been charged by Grey Mountain Management. Grey Mountain listed two Irishmen and David's friend as the leaders of the company, but none of them had any real role in the organization. Victims, unable to get in touch with anyone running the company, started filing police reports in their countries. Soon, authorities in Ireland, England, and the United Arab Emirates, Spain, the US, and Canada launched investigations into the Cartus's brands. The Times of Israel released an expose of the corruption behind binary options trading, while the Irish Central Bank's money laundering unit launched an investigation into Grey Mountain's huge credit card transactions. The brothers sensed that the authorities were coming after them, so they started to close down their business practices. In July 2017, David Cartu put a petition into Irish court to liquidate Grey Mountain. A whistleblower from their Irish satellite office came forward to police and provided more valuable information about the company's operations. The brothers erased their social media accounts, sold their shares, and built a luxury home in Ontario. By October, the Cartus had emptied their call centers and transferred millions into offshore accounts. While David stood before a judge claiming that the company was bankrupt, Josh was posting photos of him driving a $300,000 Ferrari in Greece, partying in Kazakhstan, sunbathing in the Pacific Islands, and yachting in the Persian Gulf. In February of 2020, he disappeared. So far, the Cartus have avoided any real consequences. A court in Texas charged them with engaging in commodity options fraud by deceptive device, but none of these accusations were proven. Lawyers for the Cartus argued that since the brothers didn't operate their business inside the U.S., they couldn't be charged. A judge recommended the case be dismissed. In their home province of Ontario, the Securities Commission brought civil enforcement action against the brothers on behalf of 700 Ontario residents who lost a total of $1.4 million through binary options trading with Sandbox Media. David, unlike his brothers, settled with the OSC and paid $315,000 in fines and agreed to a seven-year trading ban. Jonathan and Josh, who never appeared in court, were also banned from Canadian capital markets for 10 to 15 years and ordered to pay $3.4 million. But so far, neither brother has paid a single cent. There's little hope that they'll ever pay since most of the cartoons' assets lie outside of Canada. Investors last Hope is Ireland, where a pro bono law firm is helping 35 victims, including Hoffman, launch suits against the brothers. They're seeking damages that total $4 million. The first case resulted in a ruling that ordered David and Jonathan to pay $124,000. Other cases are expected to turn out similarly. If the cartoons are ordered to pay their victims, this ruling will be enforceable across the European Union. However, the cartoons' location is currently unknown. It's believed that Josh is in Budapest, Jonathan in Dubai, and David in Dubai or Georgia. Unfortunately, without their presence, it's impossible to enforce any sort of consequences. In May 2020, Josh wrote a letter to Finn Telegram News pleading his innocence and asked the paper to stop implicating his name in the binary options trading controversy. He threw his brothers under the bus instead, saying that it was entirely their business and he had nothing to do with it. Despite the cartoons' criminal wrongdoings, Elaine Hoffman still blames herself. She says it's shame and suffering that has bonded her to the other victims. She never told her husband been what transpired before he died in 2021. Hoffman, as a religious woman, says it's her faith that comforts her in this situation. Even though she doubts she'll ever see her money again, she believes that the brothers will face the consequences on Judgment Day. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section who you think is worse, internet gurus selling courses or prosperity preachers.